A constant theme in Scripture is the importance of generational thinking. Of course, we see this in the Old Testament in the story of the patriarchs. The Lord calls Himself by the name of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Of course, many of the Old Testament promises speak to generations. The Lord will show His loving kindness up to thousands of generations of those who love Him. We see it in the book of Deuteronomy where fathers are commanded to teach truth to their children with future generations in mind. Later in the New Testament, we have this as well. The Apostle Paul, when passing on his methodology to his spiritual son Timothy, said, Commit thou to faithful men who are able to teach others also. Here we see a generational model. Paul, one generation, speaking to his spiritual son, the next generation, and encouraging him to raise up faithful ones who are able to carry on this legacy. As a rule of thumb, I believe that world changers should adopt a three-generation vision. We should be thinking 100 to 150 years into the future. In fact, there have been times in the past when this was standard. Manifestations of this are the building of world-class institutions that have stood the test of time, or at least have served their purpose for a number of generations. We see it in the way that certain Christian leaders raised funds through endowments. You wouldn't use this funding strategy unless you were thinking in terms of a legacy. Now when I speak about legacy, I'm not talking about making a name for yourself. Rather, about having enduring generational impact. Now when I, when I talk this way, I commonly hear certain objections. The most common objection arises from eschatology. Essentially, I hear other believers say things like, what do you mean we should think three generations into the future? Don't you know that Jesus is coming back any day now? Now just to clarify, I believe in the blessed hope. I await the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Nevertheless, I believe that any eschatology which keeps us from being effective in the commission that Jesus gave us when He ascended to heaven is somehow working against kingdom purposes rather than for them. Ironically, some of the parables of Jesus in which He was encouraging us to remain faithful and productive up to the very last minute, right up to his the moment of His return, some of these same parables have been used to encourage people to draw back from occupying, to draw back from laboring, to draw back from faithfulness. One eschatological teacher put it this way when he said, Any effort at social reform is a waste of time. It's like polishing the brass on a sinking ship. We need to focus on getting people into the lifeboats instead. Well, what he meant by this is evangelism should be our singular focus. Now, of course, we dealt with this in a previous lesson, but this way of thinking is terribly harmful. It's a false binary. I remember as a young man attending meetings where the participants, all the participants in the meeting would jump into the air playfully, and we called it rapture drills. It was playful, but based in a worldview. Nobody was planning for the future. One of the real drawbacks here is that if you don't believe you have a future, you won't plan for it. And if you don't plan for it, as the saying goes, a failure to plan is essentially a plan to fail. You see, there are competing ideologies in the world. Communism, humanism, progressivism, and Islam. None of these competing ideologies are handicapped by a short-term view. Let me repeat myself. Each one of them has a multi-generational plan. In a previous generation, we talked about transformation groups and how important they are in changing society. There are negative examples of these groups as well. One such group was a group of humanist educators who met in the 1930s and wrote up a plan to take over the public school system in the United States. In that meeting, they penned a document called the Humanist Manifesto. In that document, they laid out a long-term, multi-generational plan to cut off the United States from its Christian roots and to form a secular society through the takeover and domination of the educational system. If you look at this document, it's startling how clear their vision was. What's even more startling is how meticulously they have carried it out. They said, we will take over the teachers' colleges first. We'll produce a crop of humanist teachers. 
will make the public school classroom the new pulpit of our humanist gospel. And since Sunday schools only meet one day a week, there's no way that this one hour a week voluntary religious instruction will stand against the compulsory five day a week onslaught of humanist education. Well, they did it. And now we're reaping the bitter harvest from their efforts. Another example I saw of this multi-generational planning at work was in the Islamic takeover of the capital city of an African nation. Islamic leaders were thinking three generations out, so in one generation they began purchasing key real estate in the city, right in the city center. And they financed it with oil money from the Middle East. Now the sit this city at that time was a majority Christian city. That, that's the way it was to start with. They didn't attack the Christians outright. What they did was to buy these assets from the Christians and allow the Christians to be tenants in property that they formerly owned. By the time that the Christian community realized that most of them were tenants and few were owners, it was too late. The Muslim leaders in that generation began pushing these tenants out. This disenfranchisement and pushing the Christians out into the outskirts of the city also marginalized them in the society. As I said in the beginning of this discussion, Generational thinking at previous times in the church was key to our success. It's biblical. We must return to this. Most Christian leaders I know have a six-month planning and execution cycle at most, many even shorter. This is a crisis. We have to change the way we think here. If we don't begin thinking long-term, there are a number of breakthrough strategies that the Lord wants to reveal in this generation that we will never even put on the table. In Leviticus chapter 19, God gave his people an interesting instruction about planting fruit trees. He said, when you go into the land I'm giving you, plant fruit trees. But when you plant those fruit trees, pinch the fruit off for the first so many years so that the energy of the tree is not in bearing fruit but in growing roots and let the roots go deep for several years now not only is this good horticulture there's a principle here about long-term thinking our worldview needs to allow for the reformation equivalent of planting trees and thinking generationally world changers let's make a difference that last. <music>